So we start with uh, one of you be willing to open us in prayer, please. Lord, we thank you for this morning. As we come before your presence to learn from your word, we pray that you would speak to us. Let your voice be heard in our ears and let it transform our lives, God. Help us to understand the mysteries of your word and we submit uh, Smith our man into your mighty hands and ask that you would uh, enable her to reveal the mysteries of your word, God. Help all of us to uh, pay attention and to listen from your word, God. We praise your name in Jesus' name. We pray. Amen. Thank you. Uh, so before we go uh, to a recap of what we did last week, um, I did post our assignment question on Google Classroom. Has everyone had a chance to look at that? Yes. You just uh, type or put, in, put the thumbs up or something just to let me know that you've seen it. Okay, great. Okay, so if you uh, have not yet seen the assignment, it's actually due today. Uh, and it is a little bit of work. Um, so please do go in and look at it. Uh, for those of you who've seen it, did you have any questions? Um, uh, so fast, uh, the, I mean, let me just go back to the question so I can ask it clearly. Uh, so you said uh, to mention this one issue that Paul actually explains about what's the major issue. And then uh, you asked about the excerpt exhortation to the church so does it um goes together like how he exhorted uh, for the issue or the exhortation is a basic thing like whatever he exhorted about okay so so yeah the what does he say to support that main instruction what are the things he says uh, so yeah, you, if you just get the main issue and then what are the other points that he mentions uh, to kind of tell them how they should be acting, they think that's sufficient. Okay, so it's due uh, today. And um, yes, uh, I think in the question I did mention, uh, Roslyn has asked, do you want us to give uh, Verse also, I think you said, or the reference. So in the question I mentioned, uh, please give me the reference. So you don't, uh, meaning just give me the verse, uh, the chapter and the verse. You don't have to quote the verse, just give me the reference. So that I know where you've taken that point from. Okay, so. Um, if you have any other questions or like anything, any other challenges, feel free to post on Google Classroom uh, and then I can answer it there. Uh, Zenkon, you had messaged and asked a question. I responded. Uh, was my response clear or? Okay, if yeah, if if you still have any questions, feel free to ask me during the class. Uh, you can post on chat or you can also just post on Google Classroom. Okay. Um if there are no more questions, we can go into the text for let's just do a small recap of what we did last week and then we'll go into today's text. Uh so Last week, we covered from chapter 3, verse 16, to chapter 5, verse 5. Uh, did you all have any 
uh, main things that you want to just bring up, the things that we covered last week? What were some of the main points? Ajir. So, uh, from chapter 3, from verse 16, uh, in chapter 3, when, uh, there was a sentence that says, uh, it all belongs to you, uh, it, it, it's all yours. And we uh, uh, looked into, like, what does it mean that everything is given for our benefit and uh, everything belongs to us because we belong to Christ. And in chapter four, we saw the word servant being used. And it's not a bond servant that we usually see. It's a free servant that uh, Paul actually, he wants to submit himself uh, willingly. Um, and we also saw that the servant is under the authority of Christ. Um, and we also see the word steward over there. And uh, we we spoke that they must be very familiar with the word because they are usually uh, kind of wise, <laughs> the people. Uh, so stewardship is all, all about a person who has a great responsibility, who must be trustworthy uh, and faithful. So I liked how you said uh, ministers of God are not superheroes, mm -hmm. uh, but we are servants and uh, stewards uh, of Christ. And we also saw this uh, point that says uh, where we should never go beyond uh, the scriptures and we should never boast about the leaders and we should always boast about Christ because obviously the leaders uh, are from God. Uh, and we also saw the pride that they had uh, uh, because they have this wisdom. Um, and we also saw about the final judgment of Jesus that we should never judge something before the time comes. We should wait until he does. Uh, and we also saw how they, uh, yeah. And I also liked uh, how we compared that, uh, how what is wisdom in Christ and what is wisdom uh, to the world. And we also, in the in the end of chapter 4, we saw what does it mean to be a, a spiritual father, that he takes them from immaturity to maturity, helps them to learn from others. Uh, he, he sets an example for his children. Uh, he raised them up in a way they can be greater than him. And uh, he also knows when to discipline, when to respond, when to correct, and he also know how to do uh, all of these things. And in chapter 5, we started out, I believe so, uh, and we talked about the sexual immorality that was happening and uh, how how Paul's correction came from the uh, authority of Jesus and what it's uh, we kind of started I believe what it means to be delivered into the hands of Saturn and I think you were about to explain more about this thing so yeah thank you Jeffina it's a good summary. <laughs> Thank you. So, um, yeah, we stopped at verse 5 in chapter 5, uh, where Paul tells, so he's basically uh, talking about sexual immorality that's happening in the church between a man and his father's wife. Um, and he's saying that uh, such uh, morality is not even accepted in among pagans right those outside the church uh so it's like really terrible that this is happening inside the church um but instead of being sorrowful instead of being repentant uh the church seems to have in some way taken pride in it um it's not clear what kind of pride they were taking in it but uh, possibly that they were saying we have so much religious freedom, uh, we have so much um, uh, mercy and forgiveness in Christ, we can continue to uh, do these things and we don't need to, uh, we don't have strict rules that we need to follow, that kind of thing. So where they were not repenting in the sin, but they were freely uh, talking about it as if it were nothing. 
Um, and so he says, uh, he tells them, when you all are gathered together and uh, you are there in the power of the Lord Jesus Christ, I will be with you in spirit. And then a judgment should be passed for this uh, person who is sitting. So a uh, few things to take away is that when they were gathered together, the power of Jesus Christ was with them. Uh, so even today, when we gather as a church uh, to expect uh, the power of Jesus to be present in our midst, uh, enabling us to uh, do the things that Jesus would do. So whether it be uh, in this context, this is a case of discipline, doing the will of God. Uh, in other contexts, it may be different things. It may be um, healings, it may be miracles, whatever it is, but expecting God's, uh, Jesus' power to be manifest in our presence as we gather together as a church. Um, and then verse 5, he says, uh, deliver this person over to Satan for the destruction of the flesh, that his spirit may be saved in the day of the Lord Jesus. So in this one verse, you see there is a judgment, but we also see the purpose of the judgment. The purpose is for this person to, uh, to experience salvation. So it's not judgment for the sake of judgment or judgment for the sake of punishment. It is for the sake of salvation. Uh, so we look a little bit at what it means uh, for the person to be handed over to Satan. Okay. Um, sorry. Okay, so um, it means that this person was being sent out of the covering of the church. So this person would no longer be in fellowship with the church and would no longer be under the spiritual uh, covering of the church. Uh, so we believe that uh, because the church is the uh, body of Christ, that God's spirit is present in our midst, that there is power in that fellowship that we have. Uh, and there is also a spiritual protection that we enjoy when we are part of the church. Uh, but this person being sent out of the church meant that they were losing that protection and they were losing the fellowship. So uh, the fellowship itself kind of keeps us in line with Christ, right? Where we come together to edify one another, to enable, uh, to help one another walk in holiness, walk in truth. So when they were sending him out of the church, he no longer had that kind of support in his spiritual walk. Uh, and so he was going to be left by himself uh, and he was going to have to fend for himself. And obviously uh, it's expected that Satan will take advantage of this uh, because he is in a vulnerable position and Satan will take advantage. Uh, Satan will bring temptation. And uh, in the process of facing that temptation, of recognizing what he has lost, the hope is that he will uh, repent and come back uh, to Christ and come back to the church. So that was the goal uh, in this handing over to Satan. Um, and it says for the destruction of the flesh. So uh, there are different ways in which that word sax in Greek is used, uh, which is the word for flesh there. Uh, one way is just to talk about people. So uh, Acts 2 17 says, I will pour out my spirit on all flesh or on all people. Mm -hmm. um, so that's one way in which the word is used. Uh, another way is to, uh, to talk about the physical body versus the spiritual uh, versus uh, spiritual selves, and so John 1, 13, 14 says the word became flesh. So that is uh, Jesus took on a physical body. So that's uh, Sax is used there. Uh, another way it's used is just to talk about uh, the natural or what is human. Um, and an example uh, we can look at is Matthew 16, 17. Uh, somebody can read that.
that verse for us, please? Matthew 16, 17, Jesus answered and said to him, Blessed are you, Simon Barjana, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my Father who is in heaven. Okay, so thank you, Rosa. So uh, Matthew 16, 17, it's talking about, it's, a, it's saying hum, a human person has not revealed it to you, but God uh, has revealed it to you. So uh, that's another way in which this word sax is used. Uh, another way is to talk about uh, our sinful nature or uh, sinful passions, desires. Um, so Romans 8 and Galatians 5 have a list of different things uh, that they talk about in relation to this living uh, according to the flesh rather than living according to the spirit. Uh, so that's the difference where we are uh, following the passions of our own, uh, whatever our desires are, whatever we feel like doing, rather than following the spirit of God. Uh, so that's the that's the sack. So when he's saying the destruction of the flesh, he's talking about this flesh, that sinful part of who we are. Um, so, um, When we look at what his purpose was in all of this, it was that he would repent, be restored, and he would grow in his faith, this person who was being corrected or disciplined. Uh, so that is our approach also. When we are uh, correcting someone, when we are disciplining someone, that should always be the goal. Uh, it is not to shame the person, uh, not to call out their sin in front of the church. That that's not the goal. It is uh, for their own salvation, for uh, them to come back to Christ, be restored, and uh, to grow in their faith. Uh, so very clear that um, that is the goal of discipline and correction, and when we are addressing sin. And uh, this punishment that they were saying, so where he was saying, uh, hand them over to Satan. It's not to say that we are going to inflict evil on the person. Rather, it's that we're going to take away that spiritual protection that they have being within the church. And then we are going to leave them uh, to uh, face the challenges that come with that. Okay, So we are not going to inflict evil. We are not going to hurt the person. Uh, we are going to just say, you are choosing to sin, so you cannot be part of the temple of uh, God's Holy Spirit. Right? So that is a holy place. And if you are continuing in sin, there is no place for that within God's temple. Uh, and so you need to be removed from God's temple, and then you face the consequences of that. But if, if at any point you want to come back, there's always repentance, and you can come back and be part of uh, this protection, this body, once again. So uh, we see uh, also in First Timothy that um, Paul talks about two other uh, people in a similar way where they are taken out of uh, the body of Christ. Uh, if someone can just read First Timothy 1, 19 to 20. First Timothy 1, 19 to 20. Having faith and a good conscience, which some having rejected concerning the faith have suffered shipwreck, of whom are Hymenius and Alexander, whom I delivered to Satan, that they may learn not to bless him. Yeah. Thank you. So here as well, we see the same thing of being delivered to Satan. So uh, where they were removed from the church because they were doing things that uh, they were, uh, they had become blasphemers. Uh, they had gone into some kind of false teaching. Uh, so we, they had walked away from the faith. And so they no longer could be a part of 
uh, this body of believers. And so uh, when we see Paul doing this, he's not doing that for every person who sinned in the church, right? It was in specific circumstances, uh, and especially for those who were continuing in sin, not someone who had just sinned once and had uh, had repented for that. But it was people who were continuing in sin could not be part of the church because um, in that they would be bringing sin into the church. So we'll continue to read about what is the problem with them continuing to be in the church as we uh, go through this chapter. Um, another thing to note is that uh, we're, we're talking about the power of the Holy Spirit is present in our gatherings, right? So even as we are part of the church, there is a spiritual protection that comes uh, to us and there is that fellowship that we have with believers. But if we are continuing in sin, we cannot expect uh, that that protection is available to us. Okay, so even if say nobody else in the church knows about this sin, uh, the, and you are continuing to be in the church, you are exposing yourself to uh, Satan's uh, power in your life. Like you are allowing Satan into your life. So in those cases where you yourself have opened the door to Satan, uh, then you can expect that he will take advantage of that. So that spiritual protection that is there within the church uh, may not be available because you yourself have stepped out of that protection, even if you have not, like the decision has not been made to send you out of the church. Uh, so uh, we cannot expect that if, when we continue to sin, we will still have that kind of spiritual protection. Okay, so we'll go on and see what else Paul has to say. Uh, but was this part clear? Were there any questions or? Uh, I don't think there is a rep for the spiritual, uh, for that uh, specific uh, thing of us having the spiritual protection, um, but I will look it up and I'll let you know. So Jeffina's question was, is there a verse, uh, a scripture reference for spiritual protection that God gives through the church? So I'll uh, look up that and I'll let you know. Okay, so let's go on to verse 6. Um, 6 to 8, if somebody can read those three verses, please. Your glory is not good. Do you not know that a little leaven leavens the whole lump? Therefore, purge out of the old leaven that you may be a new lump, since you truly are unleavened. For indeed, Christ our Passover was sacrificed for us. Therefore, let us keep the feast not with old leaven, nor with the leaven of malice and wickedness but with the unleavened bread of sincerity and truth. Amen. Thank you. So here Paul is continuing the same thing. Why do we need to send this person out? He's explaining, he's further explaining that. Uh, so in that first verse 6, uh, a little even, uh, so a little leaven leavens the whole love, right? So when there's yeast in bread, it spreads the whole thing and causes the bread to rise. Uh, similarly, if you allow sin to be present in the church, it will begin to spread uh, like a cancer, right? It will just start to spread 
through the body and um, it will be too late at the end to then try to deal with something, right? Because so many people have already been affected, uh, knowingly or unknowingly, they've been affected and this thing has been allowed to affect so many people. Uh, and then to try and bring correction uh, might be too late. So it's important to deal with it right at the start, to get it out and to keep ourselves, the body of Christ, pure. Uh, verse 7. Uh, so in this verse, he is going back to the Old Testament uh, Feast of the Passover and Feast of the Unleavened Bread. So if we remember when the Israelites were uh, leaving Egypt, they leave in a big hurry and they don't have time to uh, leaven their bread, right? So they leave, uh, they leave Egypt with unleavened bread. And so after this, God says, this is going to be the practice for all. When we are celebrating the Passover, at the end of the Passover, we'll have the Feast of Unleavened Bread, where you will uh, have bread that does not have yeast for seven days after the Feast of the Passover. That is to remember uh, how God brought them out of Egypt. Um, but for the for the Jews, it started to represent uh, being removed from slavery. So the absence of the yeast in their bread uh, was like they were no longer enslaved, they were no longer oppressed, uh, but they were separated from that life of bondage and oppression. Uh, so that's what it represented for them. Similarly, if we take that to the New Testament, where we are brought out of bondage uh, from Satan, uh, or bondage to Satan, we see that um, if yeast is present in the church or in our lives, that yeast represents sin, it represents uh, false teaching, it represents anything that will keep us still in bondage to a life of sin. So anything that is sinful, anything that is uh, of Satan, should be taken out of the church and taken out of our lives as believers. Um, so another thing is that he talks about uh, that we are yeah, let us, uh, that's on verse 8. Let us keep the festival not with the old bread leavened with malice and wickedness, but with the unleavened bread of sincerity and truth. Right? So he is clearly explaining what he means by it being leavened. So uh, the yeast is malice and wickedness. So that should have no place in the church. Rather, we should have sincerity and truth. So uh, purity, sincerity is uh, purity of heart, purity of intentions, of motivations, of desires, and truth. That is living under the truth of God. Um, so there is no place for uh, wickedness. There's no place for ill intentions. Malice is uh, to talk about having uh, wrong or evil intentions. There's no place for that in the church. Let's go on to the following verses. Can somebody read verses 9 to 13, please? I, verse 9, I wrote to you in my epistle not to keep company with sexually immoral people, yet I certainly did not mean with the sexually immoral people of this world or with, with the covetous or extortionists or idolaters, since then you would need to go out of the world. But now I have written to you not to keep company with anyone named a brother who is sexually immoral or covetous or an idolater or a reviler or a drunkard or an extortioner, nor not even to eat with such a person. For what have I to do with judging those also who are outside? 
do you not judge those who are inside but those who are outside god judges therefore put away from yourselves the evil person in so uh here in verse 9, we see Paul referring to his previous letter, uh, right? We talked about this earlier when he had written uh, another letter to them, but we don't have the original copy, uh, and so and we don't have it in the Bible. Uh, so he's referring to that letter, and he says in that letter, he talked about not, uh, not keeping company or not engaging with sexually immoral people. Now he explains what did he mean by that. Uh, so uh, he says he didn't mean, he was not referring to people who were outside of the church, that is people who were of the world, right? Um, so that is something for us also to understand. Uh, a lot of times it's it may be good to cut off certain relationships if they are not good or healthy with non-believers, but uh, Sometimes uh, we may cut off relationships with non-believers uh, and only be with people within the church. Uh, in those cases, we are actually uh, removing ourselves from an opportunity to be witnesses to people outside the church, right? Uh, and we may cut ourselves off because we feel that they are sinful, they are doing uh, things that are wrong and we do not want to be uh, part of what they are doing. Uh, but if there are ways that we can continue to be in relationship with them without also uh, being a part of whatever sin they are committing, uh, then we should look for those kinds of opportunities to have relationships with people outside the church so that we can uh, be witnesses. Uh, but here in this uh, context, uh, Paul is saying, I'm not asking you to leave this world, to cut yourself off from the world. I'm asking you to stay away from people uh, who are committing, he's just listed a few different sins within the church. That is people who say that they are believers um, and then they are continuing to commit these kinds of sins. Um, so when he is listing all of these sins, he's not saying these are the only sins we should be looking for, right? These are just examples of different sins uh, that uh, people were committing at that time or people might commit. But if there were other sins that were there in the church, or we see other sins in our present context uh, among people in the church, then we should uh, be careful to disassociate ourselves from these people. Um, <clears throat> and he'll go on to explain why also uh, at the end of this passage. Um, and then he says, we, we don't have to judge those outside the church because God is going to judge them. But for those within the church, it is our responsibility to judge them uh, because what he says in the last line, put away from yourselves the evil person. Now, that is taken from uh, the Old Testament, and it's used a lot in the Old Testament, uh, most actually in the context of putting to death people who had sinned within, amongst the Israelites. And the main uh, reason for doing that was to keep themselves holy as a people, because if they were allowing someone who had sinned to continue to be a part of them, that person was exposing the whole community to God's judgment. Okay, so if they dealt with the sin and with that person right away, then they were keeping themselves holy, they were keeping themselves pure, and uh, remaining the called, uh, the called people or the set apart people that God had uh, called them to be, the Israelites. And so in the same way in the church, um, to deal with that sin immediately, to get that person out, is to keep the body of Christ holy and pure. And so that's why it's important to be judging those within the church, uh, is to say that what you're doing is wrong, you are continuing in sin, and so uh, you cannot continue to bring that kind of sin and wickedness into the body of Christ, which is called to be holy. So we are protecting uh, who we are as a people called sanctified uh, by Christ. Okay, We are keeping that temple holy. 
Um, so the question then is, what about grace, right? So this the big thing here is they were boasting in the grace that they had. They were boasting in the freedom that they had in Christ, and they were allowing the sin to continue in the church. Um, but um, as we see clearly in the New Testament, grace has to come with truth. Uh, there's no separation of grace and truth. Um, so if we look at a few verses, uh, Psalm 57.10 says, For your mercy reaches unto the heaven and your truth unto the clouds. Psalm 85.10, Mercy and truth have met together, righteousness and peace have kissed. Um, Psalm 89.14, Righteousness and justice are the foundation of your truth. Mercy and truth go before your face. And then uh, John 1, 17. So the law was given through Moses, but grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. So it's important to have both, to have grace, but to also uh, remain in truth. So even when he's saying, take away that yeast, uh, because when you are an unleavened bread, then you don't have... Uh, you don't have wickedness and malice, right? You have sincerity and truth. He talks about truth being very important in the church. So truth and grace. Uh, grace without truth is uh, just false love. So we are saying we love the person, but we're not loving them to the extent that we want to correct them and put ourselves in danger of not to be liked uh, by that person. Um, and then truth without grace, is just a set of rules, right? They're just following strict rules without having any uh, kind of compassion for the person. So those two things together is very important, grace and truth. The other question is, okay, uh, is, it, is it okay to tolerate sin so that we are being open-minded? We are welcoming people into the church without judging them, uh, right? That is uh, one big question for the church at present. Uh, like, are we welcoming to people? Um, are we judging people and making them feel like they cannot come to the church? Um, so we always want to be open and welcoming to people, but we welcome them uh, based on the standards of God. Right? If they are also coming in on those standards, willing to submit to those standards, then yes, they are welcome. But if they are unwilling uh, to walk in God's ways, if they are unwilling to repent of sin, then uh, they cannot continue to be part of the body because they are bringing corruption to the body of Christ. And we see here that because these people took that step of being obedient to what Paul said, they corrected uh, this man and they uh, sent him out of the fellowship. He actually returns, he repents and is restored. Uh, in 2 Corinthians uh, 2, 6 to 8, we see that he has come back to the church and he has repented. And so we see that what they did actually helped the person, even though it may seem harsh, uh, may seem judgmental, it was for the good of the person and it resulted in good for them as well. So um, any questions in this part before we move to the next chapter? Okay, so Jeffina has asked about having um, homosexual couples attending the church to be welcome them. Uh, so it's uh, the same with, I think, any group of people committing any sin. Anyone is welcome as long as they're willing to submit to what I said. So this is submit to the standards of God. So uh, we believe that homosexuality is wrong according to scripture, right? And so uh, if they are coming in and they are willing to submit to that and they are willing to, like, seek seek help they are willing uh, to turn away from that life then they are welcome but if they do not submit to that truth then there's no place for them and this is obviously like 
us as a church. Now, there are churches that are accepted, and we can't, can't speak for those churches. Uh, but us as a church, we stand on what scripture says that homosexuality is wrong. And actually, in First Corinthians, that's one of the sins that is mentioned. Um, I think in chapter six, we we'll see that. Um, so homosexuality is a sin in this chapter itself. So uh, we standing on that scripture say, then you cannot continue in sin. And so if they are willing to come in and say, okay, we are not going to continue in this lifestyle, then they are welcome. But if they uh, want to continue in a life of sin and be part of the church, then that um, then we'd be bringing corruption to the body of Christ. So, uh, I mean, I have a very little doubt about it. So, let's say a homosexual couple is attending uh, the church, and obviously, we are not going to say you should never enter or we're going to let them come in if it's their first day of the church. And obviously, I believe the church will start noticing. Everyone will be noticing the newcomers, like how they are. Uh, so, do you? Uh, what do the pastors will actually do? Do you think the pastor should go and speak about it? Uh, that this is not something that we accept, or uh, uh, if they say like uh, we do want to change, but we need time. What the congregation actually does. Uh, yes, so um, I think what is important is that that conversation happens with the couple uh, directly, right? or with the, those people directly. And that happens in the context of you getting to know them. Now, someone has just visited our church. We don't know them. We don't, uh, we may not even know at the start that there is something to be addressed in their lives. But it is as they continue to come, as we build a relationship, or as we recognize that there is something going on here that needs to be addressed, then we address it. And uh, we address it with those people directly. Uh, so we don't have to preach it from the pulpit. We don't have to uh, start to talk to everyone in the church about it. We talk to the people involved. And uh, and then say, this is our stand. If you want to continue to come here, you can come here. And like you said, if they are saying we want to change, um, then we walk with them through that process. Uh, and if they are uh, genuinely trying to change, then we help them in the process of change. Um, but I also do want to say, so this whole thing of homosexuality has become a big thing within the church. Um, but um, to the point that we have um, really, I think, a lot of prejudice against one group of people. So uh, that's being used a lot, uh, unfortunately, against uh, the church to say that you are you only uh, you're prejudiced against us as a group of people. But that is just one of the sins, right? So even here, when we looked at this passage in uh, 1 Corinthians 5, um, so it's saying sexually immoral, it's saying uh, immoral, greedy, idolaters, slanderers, drunkards, swindlers. There are so many sins. Um, but because this one has become highlighted and is constantly being thrown uh, at the church, constantly being... Uh, raised up as an issue that we need to uh, be addressing um, it's almost become like that is the worst sin or those people are sinners and then the others are like they are sinners but we are not thinking about that kind of thing so just to be very careful that uh, we say yes this is a sin but there are other sins and we're not going to say one sin is worse than the other and we are not going to highlight uh, one sin and only talk about this sin. So we will follow scripture's example of talking about sin uh, from so many different perspectives and sometimes what we would consider very small sins like greed, with sexual immorality, both those things are put one after the other. But we hardly ever talk about greed, right? So uh, for us to uh, 
not follow, I think, um, very easily that is what the world is doing is like making this thing highlighted and we are also responding to that but for us to keep preaching scripture as it is uh, so stick to how scripture talks about sin how scripture talks about holiness and purity um, any other questions we just have a few minutes before break. Okay, then we can just uh, start off with chapter six. Uh, if somebody can read verses one to eight. Chapter 6, verses 1 to 8. Dare any one of you, having a matter against another, go to law before the unrighteous and not before the saints? Do you not know that the saints will judge the world? And if the world will be judged by you, are you unworthy to judge the smallest matters? Do you not know <clears throat> that we shall judge angels how much more things that pertain to this life? If then you have judgments concerning things pertaining to this life, do you appoint those who are least esteemed by the church to judge? I say this to your shame. Is it so that there is not a wise man among you, not even one who will be able to judge between his brethren? But brother goes to law against brother, and that before unbelievers. Now, therefore, it is already an utter failure for you that you go to law against one another. Why do you not rather accept wrong? Why do you not rather let yourselves be cheated? No, you yourselves do wrong and cheat, and you do these things to your brethren. Amen. Thank you. So here uh, we see Paul addressing another kind of judgment, right? So before this, he starts about judgment on the basis of sin uh, within the church. Uh, and here he's talking about judgment between two believers who are uh, who are having some kind of a dispute. Uh, now, in, uh, in that time in Greek culture, there was a public place where uh, cases were heard and people would present both their sides. Uh, the, so this was called a judgment seat of Bema, where the judge would sit and both parties would be seated in this public space and they would um, present their case. And this was right in the marketplace. So everybody around would be able to uh, hear and be part of that judgment. They would know what was going on. So when he is correcting the believers, he's saying you are taking out your disputes within the church to these public spaces and uh, people are watching it. Uh, it was almost like a sort of entertainment in Greek culture. Uh, so people would be gathering and hearing the disputes that are happening between believers uh, and they were taking it to someone outside the church to tell them what is right and what is wrong. Uh, so... We will continue from there after the break. We'll take a break and come back at 10 o'clock. Thank you.